Greetings from Larry and John's podcast world, where you listen when you want and where you want for as long as you want. And John, I think I heard people clicking away just as Uh-oh. I said that. I or was why. that you just dozing oh, off? Maybe what that was, that? was it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, he's back. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore our content at your own expense. And that, John, today is literally the message for our podcast. Because, John, we will be dealing in debt Oof. for the next half hour or so. Now, please don't go away because it's a really interesting conversation. And it deals with your pocketbook and the country's wallet, and it deals with a lot of things that we've got to start grappling with. And we're doing this, and we're taping this at a time when I know our Congress is dealing with a new tax bill, and I shudder to think that they're going to put on our tab another trillion and a half to two trillion dollars and leave that to the next generation. And they're not even the generation unborn. They are born, and they're crying out, what are you doing to us? Well, I, that's what I can't figure out. Nobody is addressing really that issue of our debt, which is, which is, is got to crush us sooner or later, or or cause major inflation. I mean, I just don't understand. I don't know. I can't figure it out. Well, you remember Ben Franklin, one of our founders, and such a brilliant man, a true Renaissance man. Neither a borrower or a lender be. <laughs> My mother used to say that. Yeah. Now, what happened to that message? I, I don't know. He's got to be rolling over somewhere. And as much as someone listening to this podcast, John, may gather that I'm rather moderate to liberal on many issues, but I am something of a deficit and debt hawk. I've always been that way. You've heard me yep. time and again yep. on radio because I really do think that there's a level of irresponsibility in all of this. And frankly, it's not the domain of one party or another. It depends on who's in power. Yeah, so Republicans matter. hate debt when the Democrats are in and Democrats hate debt debt when the Republicans are in, right? Right. That's absolutely. They both play the same game. They both want their, their, to give out to their own their constituencies. Own, right, right. What they, their goodies and, and they never look at the debt when they're in power. I agree with you there. Now, John, I'm not like Dave Ramsey. Okay. <laughs> Don't have a credit card. I'm Don't take free. out a car loan. <laughs> I mean, that's a little extreme. And it's all within context and moderation and the capability of repaying. I mean, I took out a home equity line of credit, John, recently, and it was just to have it. And it wasn't that I was going to abuse it. But there are a lot of people I know when they get a little money in their pocket or they get a checkbook and they say, I can do right. anything I want. We've all got to have a little bit of a governor, a little bit of a control well, on I some of this stuff. I think that's the problem with credit cards, though. I mean, they, you know, it, it, it's too easy to buy now and pay later and when the bill comes you know then you're surprised it's like hey what the heck happened but i've made it a point to use the credit card build the points use it for a tactical reason not as you know the overarching strategy right. and pay it off every right. month well only buy what you can afford exactly. and pay it off exactly, exactly. and and it, there is some insurance in that but be that your your credit card kind of protects you if exactly. you, you got a crappy product or something you can call your credit card company and they'll help you solve that so it, as long as you use it that way, it's a it's a fine tool. Well, on this podcast, you're going to learn how deeply in debt households are in America and communities. And we're going to be talking about it in so many different ways. But I must tell you that when I think about America, honestly, I worry about it more than the average moderate to liberal person. And maybe that's because of Lawrence Kotlikoff, who we have, if you want to listen to his podcast. And he tells us, as a liberal economist, that we're $200 trillion in the hole, not the $20 trillion that you hear about. And we talk about that in this podcast with Mark Hendrickson in just a moment. But when you think about it, I worry about waking up one day, honest to goodness, and reading a headline like we did in 2008, 2009, where nobody understood what happened here. And in fact, it was George W. Bush who went to Hank Paulson, his Treasury right. Secretary, and said, one day in the still of the night, you've got to explain to me what happened here because I have no idea what went on. Well, and the sad part of that, though, is we haven't fixed any of that money system so it could happen again. In fact, I believe we're now dismantling it so it can happen again, which is it, which is kind of scary. So yeah, absolutely. And I worry about waking up to that headline 
where we take that old Mao saying that nothing happens for decades and then decades happen overnight. And waking up to this headline, America's debt, unsustainable, world's banks collapse. Because if we're really underpinning all of these financial systems around the world and we're in the shape we're in, when Lawrence Kotlikoff tells us that, frankly, we're worse off than Greece. I mean, that's really something. Ah, it's, It's really terrible. So we are going to be looking at this issue today in many ways. And Mark Hendrickson, who's been on with us before. Now, he's an economist, as you know, John. And he's a fellow for the Economic and Social Policy at the Center for Vision and Values at Grove City College in Pennsylvania, a more conservative uh, group. And he wrote a column that got my attention saying, debt explosion, who cares? And that's the question we're going to pose to you today. Who cares? Well, John and I do. We do. Oh, my goodness. But the trouble is nobody wants to make the the tough decisions to deal with this. And that's the problem. Politicians want to play the game so they can get reelected. And nobody wants to make the hard decisions. But how decisions. far forward can you push this issue? Yeah, well, I just don't know. That, that I, is the I question. really do wonder, and I have my concerns. And, uh, well, look at the prominent senator, John, who when asked, where do you stand on the sexual harassment bill? He said, pay it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I digress there. Well, I had to get topical for the moment. That's right. You're right. All right. Well, that's terrible. Hey, with what money? <laughs> I know. I know. With what Charge money? It. Well, it's that's another thing. Charge Look at the fund that they set up in Congress. That's less fun. Yes. Oh, my goodness. There yeah. are so many insults to our intelligence every day. Well, listen, we're not going to do that. We're going to have a serious conversation about debt. You but you're going to find it interesting. You've got to know the truth of our debt. Absolutely. And Mark Hendrickson is with us once again on America Trends Podcast. And Mark, we visited with you last time on another topic, but you got my attention again with an editorial piece, Debt Explosion. Who cares? Do we care at all? Well, I, somebody must <laughs> not be caring because we keep getting deeper and deeper into debt. It, it, it seems that the people who probably need to care the most are the ones that care the least. And those are the ones who just cause these statistics where we read about record debt in these various areas of the economy. And of course, you're talking not only about public debt, and we see this going on. We've talked about it. State and local governments are really underwater. The federal government, I mean, it's beyond imagining how much debt they are in. But you're talking about, you start off this piece talking about private debt. How much does one contribute to our acceptance of the other? I think it's just a it's a lifestyle choice. Um, I guess I was brought up kind of the old-fashioned way, and try not to go into debt if you don't need to. Uh, my mentor in economics, the late Dr. Hans Senholtz, said always try to save at least 20% of your income. Now that's hard for that sounds very harsh. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, so, it sounds Spartan. It sounds ascetic <laughs> to today's young Americans. But uh, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Han, Hans said, look. The reason to go into debt is if you've got a great idea for a business that's going to be creating an ongoing cash flow. So if it's debt for the purpose of producing wealth, that's good. But if it's debt just for the sake of consuming more than you otherwise would, you know, getting a fancier car, buying a bigger house, getting a more expensive wardrobe, whatever, you know, just slow down. But uh, it seems that Americans today, Larry, just believe in uh, – you know, live high on the hog today and worry about paying for it tomorrow. Yeah, I've never quite understood that. I think because my dad died at a very young age and we were left with nothing because he had, uh, you know, a problem that at that time they wouldn't insure him. So I saw a family really on the brink. Uh, my mother had to go back to work. So how much of this is all built uh, by your experiences, do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to put myself in the other person's shoe. I mean, each one of us is an individual with different priorities and different values. And um, like I say, you know, I think you and I, with our life experiences and what we were taught, you know, debt is something that we're very hesitant about, whereas other people seem to be very carefree and cavalier about it. And, uh, you know, in a free society, that's, that's, that's okay. I mean, they're permitted to do that. The problem for the society as a whole comes, I think, Larry, when just too many people do it. And it's like, you know, you end up with half your people in debt to the other half of people. And um, 
you know, sooner or later, I mean, a financial crisis comes and all of a sudden somebody can't pay a debt and then the people who he owes the debt to, they, they get a cash crunch. You know, that's, that's historically the way it's been kind of a, a, a chain reaction. Uh, you know, we're in new territory these years, though, because we have such an interventionist uh, Federal Reserve. I mean, obviously, with the financial So we crisis, perhaps don't yeah. see the implications of all of this debt. We forestall them until a time when we can forestall them no more. Yeah, and and I, the, the tricky part is trying to figure out, and it's impossible for an economist to know when when is the rubber band going to snap back. You know, what what's the tolerance? How far can we go? I mean, I wrote an article <laughs> 25 years ago when the federal debt got to four trillion, and I was horrified at the time, and I thought, oh my gosh, how much longer can this go on? Well, fast forward these last 25 years. And bingo, we're at $20 trillion of debt, and we're still chugging merrily along. So what the limits are, I don't have a clue. <laughs> well, Dave Ramsey, of course, goes on his financial uh, advice program, says, no debt, we're debt-free, and he's uh, excoriating people for getting into debt. Now, you were talking about if you're going to build a business and you need to get started, we're all in debt, those of us who have ever taken out a mortgage. I mean, we wanted that home, but we then put it in perspective as to whether that was a quarter of our earnings at the time. Could we afford it? I mean, give us some more rules of the road as you see them. I mean, for the individual who knows they have to at some time rely upon some uh, lender and uh, they have to uh, go forward with their lives. They can't ever buy into the American dream without doing that. Yeah, I, I wish I'd known you were going to ask that. I've got a list of uh, remarks that were jotted down by a 20 something fellow a few years ago urging his peers not to go into debt. And he was talking about just the, the psychological stress that it places on him and so on and so forth. And he said, Look, you know, you, you can live in a smaller apartment, you can drive an older car. I mean, these things don't really matter. Uh, in terms of your lifestyle, but then if if you're getting into debt dangerously and all of a sudden you know your cash flow is really crimped, uh, it's bad news. You mentioned the house mortgage. I mean, gosh, I, I, I've been astonished to read that in the 50s in a place like New York, an accountant, uh, a house might cost uh, you know just a little bit more than one year's salary. Well, mm. now people are are buying houses that are multiples of a year's salary, and how we got into that, I think, is Creative financiers have, uh, you know, we, we've, it's become tote the note. In other words, structure the loan in a way where, you know, the sticker price is really ridiculous on the surface of it, but as long as you can pay a certain amount a month, you're okay. Except that percentage has tended to creep up over time. I mean, I don't know what it is now. I mean, it used to be a rule of thumb that, uh, you know, you don't want more than 25% of your income going to your, your mortgage debt. And I think now a lot of lenders say, well, you know, 35%, whatever. And the result is we're all having to pay higher prices for houses. So, I mean, all sorts of distortions enter into the market and all sorts of fragility and vulnerability from, from when a debt crisis might occur. But as long as the, as the music is going and doesn't <laughs> stop, it's like musical chairs. As long as the music's going, you're okay. It's when the music stops that it gets a little dicey. Well, how much has the federal government, for example, with uh, making uh, mortgage interest payments deductible and encouraging all of these different uh, devices, the 30-year mortgage, how much has that kind of pushed out our notion of what kind of debt we're really in? Or the whole notion, well, you'll never pay off that mortgage because you're going to move, you'll get uh, another home, it'll be bigger, with more equity. How much do we play into this as a society and encourage some of this uh, profligacy that we're talking about? Yeah, I certainly can't quantify it, but I think it's uh, indisputable that, that uh, essentially what the government is doing by making debt tax deductible, it's, it's essentially subsidizing or encouraging debt. They say, hey, well, you know, we'll, we'll ease the pain for you, so go ahead and do it. And it happens at the corporate level, too, where it, you know, it can make sense for, for businesses in, instead of raising you know, capital in the equity markets to just go deeper into debt. And, of course, with the artificially low interest rates of the last few years, we've, we, we've seen uh, you know, record debt. And, and uh, you know, my, my own concern is that the Federal Reserve has painted itself in a, in, in a corner. Mm. We hear occasional talks or rumors that, Janet Yellen's going to be normalizing, or her successor will be normalizing interest rates over the next few years. Normalizing meaning going from, 
you know, one or two percent to, you know, three, four, five percent, whatever. I don't think that's going to be politically possible because of what that would do. You know, much of the government debt is is uh, short term and low interest. And so it rolls over very quickly in a very short period of time. And if all of a sudden in a couple of years we have to roll over, you know, several hundred billion dollars of debt and all of a sudden interest rates are 5% instead of 1.5%, I mean, that's a huge increase in the carrying cost of the government's debt, which means that if they have to pay that off, then they can't use those tax revenues to do something else. And uh, so that could precipitate a political crisis. Do you feel that this is a house of cards? I mean, don't forget, we've come out of this recession, and it was a big one, as slowly as you can ever imagine. And we've done it on the back of 0% uh, borrowing rates from the Fed. I mean, is this really a bubble waiting to burst? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, we had a kind of a rickety financial structure, and, uh, the, the you know, sometimes... I liken it to that uh, catastrophic forest fire that they had in Yellowstone back in 1988 when half the park was incinerated. And everybody said, well, why was it so big? Well, the reason it was so big was because in the prior years and decades, every time a natural fire started from lightning or something, uh, the Forest Service went in and put it out. <laughs> and fires are, you know, fires happen naturally in the life cycle of a forest. It's supposed to clean out the deadwood, and then it leads to uh, more vigorous growth and renewal. The problem is by deferring the inevitable, by, you know, just suppressing these littler fires, they ended up with a conflagration that it consumed half the park. And I view our national debt kind of the same way, or, or our, our social debt that individuals have. It's like, you know, better that there should be some smaller and admittedly painful bankruptcies, you know, in the present, but instead we've, we've political intervention, the, the, the forces that be in Washington have jumped into this situation and tried to, uh, you know, patch it over and, and just patch the whole thing up. Uh, eventually, though, I think it will have to collapse. And again, Larry, I admit, I don't know when that collapse point is. Well, I've got to tell you, you really got our attention. John and I are nodding at each other here because we just did a couple of podcasts on forest fire suppression and the oh, bad yeah. policies <laughs> and I the fact that. that we need... It's amazing. This Dr. Chad Hansen, a uh, remarkable man, a forensic environmentalist, but, I mean, he's amazing, but he talked exactly in the way that you have. Well, let, let me ask you about debt, because it's interesting, and I have referenced this, I think, on the podcast before, but I met a guy who said to me that... Um, well, Mao Zedong, and he uh, attributed this to him, saying that sometimes nothing happens for decades, and then sometimes decades happen overnight. And I think that's what happened to George W. Bush back in 2008 when he went to Hank Paulson and said, one day we're going to have to sit down and you're going to have to explain to me what the heck went on here, because I have no idea how this occurred virtually overnight. Yeah, that that's what the 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 sneaky nature of a debt bubble is is that you know it's just kind of building and building, but we're sort of lulled into complacency because hey, times are good, and then all of a sudden we get past the tipping point. Like then it was the housing market. You know, prices in certain cities of the country had escalated to a ridiculous extent. And all of a sudden, though, we ran out of eager buyers, and the market tipped and started to go down, and it happened when the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates belatedly. And uh, all of a sudden, there was a rush to the exits, and everybody was trying to unload, and we had a crash. And then it, uh, that spread into the financial markets, and, and we know what happened there. So, it, yeah, um, uh, it can happen with painful rapidity. <laughs> and it can happen, as you say, overnight. Is it all built on confidence? And, and where does that confidence have to fall away for these things to quickly unwind? Yeah, I think that's a great word, confidence, because I mean, even, even the value of our paper currency depends on our confidence in it. Uh, the fluctuating value of Bitcoin depends on the, you know, how different speculators value it. Um, Confidence is, you know, that, that's, that is something that if, if, if you can gauge confidence correctly, um, but again, 
who knows when confidence will be lost? What, what, what is the straw that breaks the camel's back? What is the tipping point? And those things only tend to become apparent in hindsight, not in foresight. Well, let me ask you, when you uh, relay in your article, Debt Explosion, Who Cares, that Americans now have the highest credit card debt in our history. That was from Market Watch on August 8th. Student loan debt, in 2017, a $1.3 trillion crisis from Forbes. A record 107 million Americans have car loans. U.S. household debt hit a record in the first quarter. And then we read where there are a lot of Americans who couldn't replace four tires on their car if required to at a moment in time, and they needed that car to get them to their job. I mean, what's going on here? Yeah, and it's not only the um, amount of debt on the cars, but it's it's larger car loans. I mean, people are taking out like six and seven year loans, and sometimes that's greater than the life of the car. And uh, you know, because I mean, hey, I mean, some of these cars now forty, fifty thousand dollars. I mean, it's 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 a very serious purchase. And and uh, yeah, I just uh, you know, I I really think that. Uh, uh, you read about the large percentage of these loans that are would be categorized as subprime, and you, you just kind of wonder at some point if it's like, uh-oh, and all of a sudden people start defaulting on those loans, and then cars starting getting dumped onto the secondary market, and the used car market price you know, plummets considerably, and then other people are finding themselves owing debt on cars, and the car's not even worth half what they owe on it, so they might, you know, break their leases or whatever or, or, or default and let them repossess the car just the way people used to let the lending authority uh, repossess their house. They'd wa- walk away from it. I, I mean, I, th- these things I haven't, I, I haven't, to be honest, thought about the ugly things that are going to happen because it's a very unpleasant thing to contemplate. We'll return to this episode of America Trends in just a moment. If you like what we're doing here at America Trends Podcast, please don't keep it to yourself. I know there are a lot of people, John, who think, well, if I'm listening and somebody else wants to listen at the same time, maybe we're going to collide and they're not going to be able to hear us. Is that the way the technology works? No, there's plenty of bandwidth. Everybody can listen at the same time. All right. Well, that dispels that that myth. (laughs) Now, you can do a number of things that would really be helpful to us. You could give us a kind rating or a review at Apple Podcasts, and that boosts what they consider to be our value and visibility. What does that do, John? Well, that puts us in the forefront so that you can find us easier, and most important is other people can find us easier. And you can subscribe there or on our site, americatrendspodcast.com, or wherever you're listening, so we can alert you to new episodes of the podcast, which, by the way, we put out twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And stay in touch with us on both Facebook and Twitter at Trends Podcast. Or you can like us on Facebook or follow us where, John? On Twitter. On Twitter. That's right. Where the world turns to hear fake news or whatever it is. Well, you can direct message us at Trends Podcast (laughs) or using hashtag Trends Podcast. And, you know, John, with our growing audience, and really it's been pretty remarkable, a lot of people just came to us the last month or two, and they might have missed earlier episodes. Can they get them again? They can look through them and and, uh, pick the ones they want to listen to. They're all on the website, and a lot of them are up on iTunes, many of them. All right. Well, listen, there's lots of material to listen to. We hope you have the time and will lend it to us because we try to make it worth your while. And thanks so much for listening. And tell your friends. We now return to this episode of America Trends. Well, we do talk about debt. We usually don't talk about it enough in our own lives, but we do talk about it when it comes to the debt ceiling for our government, and that is a debate that will continue to rage on. And when you look at the way we really address that, Republicans and Democrats, uh, they all seem to find their way to the fact that uh, unless we do this, the full faith and confidence in the U.S. currency is going to be jeopardized, and neither really wants to take the fall for the implications from that. Yeah, each has a, each of the two parties has its political constituency. I mean, the Republicans cut taxes, the Democrats increase spending. 
although there are some big spending Republicans, don't get me wrong. I mean, and, and, and that is the ultimate problem in Washington, Larry. It's, it's, it's overspending. We're really spending beyond our capacity. And so what happens here, though, there's a political dynamic that enters into it. It's like, okay, you know, you get kind of a Mexican standoff between the Republicans and the Democrats, and it's like, well, we've got to have this spending, but we really can't tax the people to pay for it. What are we going to do? Ah, solution, let's borrow the money. Or print well, it. Well, or, or, or print it. But, of course, when we, we talk about borrowing, that's what the $20 trillion of federal debt is. That's money that's been borrowed. Now, what's insidious about it and what I think is unethical about it, and this goes back to Thomas Jefferson, who, who believed that government should always pay its own bills in real time, because if you don't, if you go into debt, who pays the debt? The younger generation inherits that debt. So what we're doing is... We're literally saying, okay, we're not willing to tax today's taxpayers in order to fund all the spending that we're engaging in, so we're going to defer it. I mean, what is a debt but a promise to raise taxes on somebody else in the future? The only way they're going to make good on those debts is to tax people in the future, in other words, the people who are young. And a lot of these people, see, this is what's insidious. We fought a revolution in the 1770s, you know, no taxation without representation. We got young people who have been too young to vote for these spending things, but when they become adults, they're going to spend their whole working lives paying the interest on those debts for the spending that they never voted for themselves. I mean, that's the, the ultimate political disenfranchisement there. Well, you know, we've had Lawrence Kotlikoff on with us many times on our podcast and radio program. He's a liberal economist from BU, and yet he pegs our fiscal gap uh, which is way more than the public debt of $20 trillion, at about $200 trillion because of obligations that we have made to this generation and everyone born uh, put against uh, some kind of model uh, when we look at revenues that we can imagine based on the current tax system. So he's pegging it at over $200 trillion. Do you agree with that? Well, I can't count that high, but... <laughs> I think he I think he's essentially correct. I mean cuz what what he's talking about is is the unfunded liabilities, the promises that we've made that uh we haven't had to borrow for them yet because these are promises to pay in the future. But when the future arrives, it's like okay, the bill comes due. We promised to make this additional spending. So, yeah, I mean the, the certainly the financial hole that the United States government is in is far deeper than than 20 trillion dollars. Uh I'm willing to accept Dr. Kotlikoff's <laughs> estimate, uh, but I, th I think really, you know, why quibble? One hundred trillion, two hundred trillion. <laughs> trillion? Yeah. I mean, at, at that, that point, point, Larry, I don't think it matters. Well, I said at that point, you stop counting and you start praying. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you: You wrote the present democratic political system is all about some Americans getting benefits that other Americans pay for. I, I would make another argument, which is that. Everybody is getting benefit, even if they don't want to acknowledge it. And let me play this out for you. I mean, many of us who are middle class and we're on Medicare. And if I have one terrible incident of a health uh, scare, I could spend seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 trying to remedy that, um, cancers we know, heart to conditions. And yet, over my lifetime... I may have put in $150,000, and yet that person, in my mind, doesn't recognize that they, too, are benefiting directly from the system. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, you raised multiple points there. I wrote an article about the, the Medicare thing a few years ago, I mean, where the, the average taxpayer puts in maybe $100,000 during his work career and then receives $300,000 worth of benefits. So that's a great deal. The only thing is that's not affordable for everybody. So that's where, where part of the debt comes in. Um, I was, my mind was racing when you were saying that, Larry, because there's so many different angles here. Uh, mm. the b b businesses. I mean, there, there, there are winners and losers. You know, the, 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 the sugar beet growers, the corn farmers, they, they get subsidies from, from the federal government. We end up paying higher prices at the, at the food market for it. We also have to get taxed more to pay for the food stamps that go to the people that can't afford the higher prices of food. Mm. And then we have to store the extra food that sometimes piles up because there's no, no market for it now. And then eventually we give it away in government aid, uh, foreign aid to, to other countries and crash their agricultural markets. I mean, it, it, but mm. some people benefit more than others in, in our political transfer system. I mean, they do studies about the, the, the states. And this is an issue with the current tax debate is like, okay, will Trump succeed in repealing the exemption that people get on their state and local taxes. Well, that does 
favor the people in the high tax states. It means that the people in the low tax states have to absorb more of the burden of, of, of federal spending. So, I mean, the, there are net winner, winners and losers, and that's what the whole political struggle in Washington is about, is, is to, you know, relative to the other guy, try to keep ahead. But, uh, I mean, in, instead of just concentrating on producing wealth and all of us getting richer, it's, it's like, who can fleece the other guy? <laughs> well, you're an economist, and when you do look at it, for example, when they're talking about a static model versus a dynamic model, and we hear about these tax cuts, we're hearing less, I think, about tax reform. I'm not hearing about whose uh, ox is going to be gored in this process. I'm not hearing about taking all the underbrush that has built up in our tax code since 1986, the last major reform, and stripping all of that away. Where, where did that go? Oh, boy, good question. You know, each, each president has his priorities. Um, whether you're pro or Khan, when it comes to President Trump, let's just say he's a very idiosyncratic uh, individual, and it's sometimes hard to read what's, what's really going on there. I mean, wh what is he proposing? Okay, uh, a simplification of the tax code. All right, I've got no problem with that as an economist. But really, um, what does that do going from seven to, I mean, it only takes you about 10 seconds to figure out whether that's 25% of what I've got or 20%. I, I mean, that's not a major Shift. Right. Exactly. Now, I think something like repealing the state and local tax exemption is, and that's why it's going to be mm. a political hot potato. It's going mm -hmm. to be very difficult uh, to, to, to address that. Uh, the business side of it, you know, lowering corporate taxes, I, you know, e even the liberal economists at the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, I mean, they've done studies. The whole eco I, liberal economists, conservative economists, they're pretty much unanimous, and this doesn't happen very often, but if there's one issue where they tend to be close to unanimity, it's that the corporate tax is the worst tax in the world. It's the least efficient, it's the most disruptive, it introduces the most irrationality, because ultimately people pay taxes. I mean, you know, Exxon isn't uh, a human being like you and I. I mean, so the question is, who's going to pay? Exxon's a tax collector, so who's actually going to pay that tax? Is it going to be the consumer? Is it going to be the employees of the company, or is it going to be the owners, the shareholders? And, and, and it gets spread out over those. I'm hoping that they do reduce uh, corporate tax rates. I'd love it to go way down, even below 20%, simply because it would make the United States much more desirable as a domicile, a headquarters, a base for all multinational corporations, whether they be American or foreign. If we've got the lowest cost of doing business, there's going to be a lot more business here, which means a lot more Americans are going to need to get employed. And, and so, you know, I mean, Does I it? view that... I, I think view the there are some who imagine that they may not be linked any longer. I do want to ask you about a linkage in one more facet. Warren Buffett saying, look, we got enough corporate lawyers. They've written the tax code that we've got. And so if anybody's paying 35%, stand up and we'll laugh at you because no one's paying that. But exactly. he did, but he did yeah. say that the thing that we should keep our eye on is the fact that we're the only industrialized nation that links health care to employment. And if we could get that linkage unbroken, because those costs are going up much higher than the impact of these taxes that they have already figured their way around. How do you react to that? Yeah, I I agree. I mean, there seems to be an inequity there. And, and you referred to another one as you were phrasing your question, and that is that the you know some corporations uh, general electric was very famous for this in the last few years paying almost nothing in terms of corporate profits tax which is why if if your concern is equity you know fairness the fairest corporate tax rate is zero because then you don't have these weird situations where where one guy competing in a market is paying you know 25 percent mm. after his his accounts are done working <laughs> on it and the other guy is paying two percent you know if it's down to zero then everybody pays the same so 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 there and and it, you know it's like the pricing for the health care that you're talking about i mean people working for corporations where they, they there's a tax break involved i mean you could say it's it's subsidized or it's priced differently than it is for people who aren't receiving employer-based uh, health care uh, insurance. And Isn't so, that what the whole debate about Obamacare was really about? I think a lot of it. Uh, I, I think there were ulterior motives involved there, too, but I, we, won't, we won't go there now. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, when you do look at where we are today, with the debt to bomb and you asking, well, it's exploding, but does anybody care? I mean, most people are not driven to care until it really affects them personally. And we keep putting off that obligation. And we keep saying, we're going to have that discussion about debt. We're going to have that discussion about America and what benefits we're providing to all Americans. And we never seem to get to that, do we? Well, we do go through something I'll call the, the debt dance ritual. I mean, when, it, when, when it's time, you know, they just deferred it again. But when the next debate in Washington is about raising the national debt ceiling, then we'll have a little bit of a discussion. But it's mostly going to be political oratory. You know, you've got the, the spenders who aren't going to change, the tax cut people aren't going to change. And, it, you know, when push comes to shove, they're not going to want to shut down the government. That's going to be too politically unpopular. I mean, I, I quoted Joseph Demest in my article, you know, every country has the government it deserves, and the American people want things now, and there's no Congress that I think is going to deny them that. So I just think that whatever protestations there are will ultimately be ignored, and the debt ceiling will continue to go larger. Well, as the great and now unfortunately late Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. And I'm waiting for something yeah. to happen. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was just reading something uh, since I got your invitation to come on the podcast. Uh, you know, there are people who have found out in the short run that too much debt is not a healthy thing. Uh, this little item, I, I can't remember the source, but uh, they, they cited Sports Illustrated finding that 78% of NFL players and an estimated 60% of NBA players go bankrupt or are under financial stress in just two to five years after they retire. Now, these are young Americans who have made, in some cases, tens of millions of dollars, and yet in a very high percentage, they're either completely stressed out or, or actually outright bankrupt. You know, these bankruptcy, I mean, they listed some of the athletes in, in multiple sports. It's not just those two sports, but uh, this is symptomatic of America as a whole. It doesn't seem to matter what our income is we always want to spend more. Even the million-dollar incomes, they want to spend more. And as these individuals have found out, that it's very painful when the piper comes to be paid. The question is, the big piper, the big debtor, Uncle Sam, the biggest debtor in the history of the world, well, when is the piper going to be paid? I don't know. Um, they'll, my, my suspicion is they'll always be able to honor their debts and pay off their debts because they've got the Federal Reserve in their in their corner. Mm. So, I mean, ultimately, you'll get paid. You, you know, the money will get paid somehow. Oh, oh there'll there'll be some some bankruptcies. Don't get me wrong, but the, the, they'll try to keep the the overall system, the the larger system, the the infrastructure, which means like Wall Street and stuff. They'll the, you know they'll they'll keep it propped up, and if they have to pump trillions of dollars into the economy, they'll do it. So. Debts will get paid. Uh, the dollars you received in payment for those debts might not buy as much in the future as they do today. Uh, we've been seeing this as a long-term trend for the last 50 or 60 years. So, um, <laughs> you know, it, w one way or another, debts do get paid, Larry, and it's not always a, a pain-free way. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming back to America Trends Podcast. Mark Hendrickson, uh, we always enjoy your time with us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Larry. It's very kind of you. Thanks for listening to this episode of America Trends.